I'm uh, Jonathan Fung. I'm a professor of physics and astronomy. And, but far more relevant for this is I'm also co-chair of the What Matters to Me and Why Organizing Committee. And so it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome you to today's talk. This is actually the kickoff talk for our um, sixth season, which is amazing to those of us who started this thing. Um, we have had now 35 talks and seven more scheduled for this year which are, um, I think, guaranteed to follow up in the great tradition of the previous 35. Since this is the first talk, let me just say a few words about this series. Uh, the idea behind this series was, in part, to recognize the fact that universities are not just places where we uh, train students for careers, where you learn facts and subjects, but also a place where we can uh, broaden our horizons, not just students, but also faculty and staff and uh, just learn more about the world and our place in it. We've done this by um, having leaders of our campus, faculty and staff, uh, give talks. This happens once a month, and uh, there are seven talks a year. And we listen to them here. We also put them on the web through videos. And so there's a beautiful uh, video library of past talks, which you can get on the web. And the talks are just, um, well, we just ask the people to tell people what matters to them and why, and that's it. That's the instruction. And the talks go all over the place, but they are inspiring, they are hilarious, they are all sorts of great things and very, um, very entertaining. So we're glad you're here to join us for this. Uh, I have just a few um, sort of bookkeeping, housekeeping sort of uh, instructions. Uh, we do get us lunch here. Uh, please pack up everything and take it with you when you leave. On your way in, in addition to the lunch, you probably got a questionnaire. We would really love for you to fill that out. Um, tell us what you like and what you don't. And in particular, uh, we rely on those to suggest nominate new speakers for the following year, which is not tw till 12 months from now, but we'll start that process not too long from now, actually. So please let us know if you have particular people on campus you'd like to hear talk. Um, I should also mention that this series has spun off, like all great successful things do, another series. And that is uh, the alumni series. And so in fact, there is a talk at the alumni series tomorrow, I believe, which uh, if you go to the web page, um, you're welcome to come to also. That's a series where we bring back alums who have gone on to do really interesting things. And they talk to students, but also faculty and staff. Uh, our next talk is going to be November 29th. So this is unusual. Usually we're on the second Wednesday of each month. This coming one for various scheduling difficulties will be actually after Thanksgiving. But uh, please look for that registration page. That'll show up three weeks before then. It'll be Abe Lee, who's a professor and chair of biomedical engineering. Okay, so with that, I will then ask you or invite you to just uh, spend 60 seconds saying hi to your neighbor, and then Dean of Students, Ramin Talesh, will come up and introduce our awesome speaker today. <laughs> Once again, I'm Ramin Talesh, Dean of Students here at UC Irvine and ABC for Student Life and Leadership. <clears throat> I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Chief Jorge or George Cisneros. Chief Cisneros has his bachelor's degree uh, in architecture from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and his master's degree in criminal justice at Chapman University. Now, I'm not going to read his bio because you have the bio, but I will share um, being a police chief is a tremendous responsibility. And what we want to get at, though, is who is the person beneath the uniform, right? So we want to know how he went from architecture major to police chief. He spent 27 years in the field. He's been the police chief here at UC Irvine for two years. I met with him a few months back to prepare for this. And he shared at that moment that he knew what he wanted to talk about. He laid out a format for what he wanted to do. He had been to the series last year, and he'd watched all the videos. So as John Wooden said, a failure to prepare is preparing to fail. And he's prepared. And that's one probably aspect of his job that he has to uh, have about him. Um, the one thing I appreciate also is his accessibility to students. Uh, we had an all-university leadership conference about a week and a half ago off campus on a Sunday. About 180 of our student leaders were at this conference. And the chief was there. 
and able to address the group and then meet in small groups uh, and teams with students, addressing their concerns, talking about his uh, pathway, and then hearing from students and their, their issues and, and concerns. And that accessibility and that openness is something that's wonderful to have from a police chief. And so with that, I'm going to stop because I know he has it all laid out for you today. But let's give a round of applause to Chief Jorge Cisneros. Okay, uh, well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, all right. So um, before you, uh, obviously to my left, you see what matters to me. And I just wanted to inform you how I went through this process because I think sometimes, you know, we think we know what's important to us, but then other people will tell us something different. So I went ahead and I contacted my, uh, my two great kids, my wife, uh, my mother, uh, friends, relatives, the neighbor that doesn't like me uh, next door, and uh, I asked them to, to think of one word that, that would describe what matters to me. And so therefore, what you see is those things that they defined, and some of those I, I definitely agree with. The one on top is the, the most interesting one because I think it, it can be used in a, in a funny way. I am somewhat structured, and people would say that if you went to my house, and you went into my closet, you would know what structure is. Um, <laughs> my shirts go from light to dark patterns. Um, my suits go in the same way. Um, everything is folded three and three. And uh, my socks are also color coordinated. And so uh, my shoes, they're, they're all aligned by color and by active wear. And uh, so people have fun with me when they come to my house because they know that I will know if something is out of line and they do have fun with me. They will change things in my closet <laughs> just to have fun with me. So I'm, I'm extremely humbled uh, uh, to follow in the footsteps of those before me and hope that my presence today will continue uh, to enhance the program. I've had the great pleasure to sit, sit where you guys are at and admire those who have uh, stood here and shared their fascinating journey and what matters to them. While each, uh, while each speaker is unique in the why, there are similarities in what matters to me through all the speakers who have come before me, or yeah, before me, the ones that I have seen. So, there, uh, so today I stand uh, on their shoulders and continue the journey. Um, I made the decision not to wear a uniform or a suit. Many of you will either see me in a uniform or a suit, but as Ramin said, they wanted to see who the real person is underneath. And um, you know, the uniform and my profession have been an important part of my life, but it doesn't define me. I, I am just like the many of you in this room. Um, I, I am a son, uh, I am a husband, I am a father, and I am a friend. Um, and, and also, I like to be comfortable. You know, and so I am wearing uh, four-way stretch jeans. <laughs> How many own four-way stretch jeans? And I know you, d there's got to be two-way at least in here. <laughs> All right, so, so I'm extremely comfortable. So today, uh, you're going to hear from, from me. Uh, I am bilingual, I'm bicultural. Uh, so I go by Jorge, or I go by George. I go by other names, but I'm going to leave those alone. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, significant emotional events throughout our lifetime explain the why and the paths we choose in our life. So I'm going to cram 52 years, and I know I, I don't look 52, <laughs> in, in, in about 30 minutes so that I can give you some opportunity to, to ask questions. And so being a structured guy, I was going to go chronological, but look, I'm going I'm to change it up a little bit. And I'm going to start um, 1990. And the reason I'm going to start there is because Ramin ha had a question. How, how did I get from architecture to, to being the chief of police? And actually, I, I should say I probably should start in 1985. And so in 1985, I was attending uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, obviously my degree in architecture, but I needed a job. Uh, you know, I came from a single parent. My single parent was putting me through school. 
Um, and that was enough. And so I needed a job to be able to afford the extracurricular activities that I wanted to do. And uh, where I had grown up, the interaction with police departments was extremely uh, minimal to the point that I had never really actually spoken with anybody in the profession. And so uh, I was in a fraternity. Yes, I was in a fraternity. And uh, a fraternity brother said, hey, uh, you say you need a job, go to the police department. And uh, I was kind of shocked. I was taken back. I go, ah, I don't think so. And he goes, they're, they're paying double the minimum wage. I said, where's the application? <laughs> um, back in uh, 1985, it was $3.35 if many of you remember. And um, that was my first um, understanding of what policing was about. I saw the first time what they really did. I had perceptions from my community, but this was the very first time I knew what they do, they do for, for, for their profession. And so um, I graduated from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. I got my first job not too far from here. I was working in Newport Beach overlooking the marina, and um, I have to be honest with you, I thought I had I hit a home run. I, I was doing that. In the meantime, uh, I had uh, decided to give back to my community, and I was going to be a reserve police officer. And as I continued in that path, um, I learned that I had a passion for this. But uh, it took me a while, because uh, I have to be honest with you, I was scared. Um, not scared of change was scared of telling uh, an individual that had uh, sacrificed her whole life for me uh, to tell her that uh, I was going to forego the dream that she had for me. And so uh, it took me about two years to, take the, you know, to get the courage. And in, in 1990, I, I came forward to my mom and I told her that uh, um, I was leaving architecture and I was going into, into policing. Um, I have to be honest with you, it didn't go over very well. Uh, my mother had, like I said, sacrificed, and her, her goal was to get me out of the area I had grown up in, and she's, she found out that I was going back. I wanted to go, go back to that community, because the reality is, is that you can't change things without being in the field, and hopefully you understand what I mean by being in the field, being in the game, instead of being outside the game and just being a fan. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to make change of where I grew up. And so I, I made the decision that that's where I was going to go work. So my story doesn't really, uh, really start there, but I wanted to, to tell you what, what that change was about. And it was something internal. And, uh, it, and it took some time just because of, of individuals I thought I was letting down. So in 1971, I was a six-year-old boy. And... Uh, I was riding my bicycle. Uh, we lived in an apartment complex. And uh, I noticed something. I noticed my dad was um, putting clothes into his VW Bug. Um, at the time, I didn't, I didn't understand what was going on. But I would find out that uh, my father was, was leaving. Um, again, I was six years old. I didn't understand the concept. I remember him driving away. Uh, I also understood that my mother did not uh, have a command of the English language. She had no job, no car, no washer and dryer. And I'll tell you why I put that in there. And no family support. I would learn much later in life that my mom would make the biggest sacrifice of her life. My mother had two options that day my father left. She could go back to Peru with her two sons where she had her whole family and support in a profession. Or she could stay, no English, no car, etc., and see what tomorrow brings, as this was a land of opportunity. You know, I'm a 52-year-old man today with kids. I'm not sure if I could pick option two. Um, you know, the next few years were, uh, were a challenge. But my mom worked very hard to make make a normal life for me. And uh, I'll go back to the uh, washer and dryer. Because I don't think, and I, and I have to be honest with you, my kids don't even really understand the concept of that. When you don't have a washer and dryer, and when you go a mile away to a laundromat, put coins in, wash clothes, 
and you're a six-year-old boy who has to fold, and that's why I fold things in three. Um, and then walk a mile with clothes, making sure that it doesn't get unfolded. That was a huge task. My mom ruled with an iron fist, and I mean an iron fist. Um, so I remember that. I remember that. Or going to the gro uh, grocery store and helping my mother because of her lack of the English language uh, when things were asked uh, that uh, I matured. I matured quite early. Um, cooking and doing the many other things that I've seen other people stand before me here who have done the same thing, you know. And so I'm not, I'm not different. I, I'm just like you. I'm not saying that all of you have experienced that, but uh, I'm just part of society just like yourself. So, um, you know, I, I, I knew that monetarily we, we lacked a little bit, but we had abundance of love. You know, my mom was a loving, a loving person. And uh, while the words may have been very minimal, the actions were always there. And I, and I knew for a fact that my mother uh, loved us. And, uh, and, you know, seeing her work two jobs was uh, tremendous in the things that happened. I mean, things that happened to everybody's life. I remember my bike got stolen, and she had saved up. That was my Christmas present. And she had saved up, and then she went and she got another job because she wanted to replace that bike. She replaced it in a month, you know. And so all those things are things that have stayed with me throughout my life. But hard work, work ethic. My mom had it, and um, it took her about 10 years, but it paid off. She, uh, she, she got the American dream, and she bought her first house um, by herself, no assistance. Um, that 1981 was a, a, a really significant year because that, that occurred. Um, we had to move from the community I lived in because she couldn't afford that area, so we had to go into another area. So I, as a as a 15 year old boy, I was a l slightly upset because I was changing high schools. Um, but you know things happen, you know. And uh, that year, I was uh, I, I knew I was going to go to college because it, it was drilled in me from childhood from my mom that that was going to happen. And uh, so I had to take two years of foreign language, right? For two years of foreign language to to be able eligible to go to college. And obviously, I I picked Spanish. So, uh, you know, it was easy. <laughs> so I sat in the back, and uh, this young lady uh, walked in. Uh, she's probably about 90 pounds. Uh, she had a great big smile, and uh, I said, wow. And uh, she, uh, she's my wife. <laughs> um, yesterday was our anniversary, 25 years. You know, she's, uh, she's my soulmate. Uh, I owe her a lot. I, you know, I've had some, some great, great women behind me, and I've been extremely uh, fortunate for that. And so, so in 1981, I met, I met my wife-to-be at that time. We became great friends, and, and I think that's why our relationship has lasted so long. It's just because of our friendship. Um, I went away in 1983. I went away to, uh, to college. I was first generation due to my economic uh, issues, you know, I got some Pell Grants, but other than that, uh, my mother worked hard to uh, put me through school. I've already explained to you what, um, what happened uh, in 1985. I, it's when I first uh, learned what really policing was about, and it's kind of interesting that I learned policing at a higher education facility, and here I am today leading a police department in higher education. You know, so in 1992, um, which is the year I got married, and, but it was also the year of the Rodney King riots. And um, I was uh, a new officer uh, working in a very diverse community. And uh, I, I think these, these are the significant emotional events that I talk about. Um, you know, the catastrophes that occurred that day uh, during the incident uh, have seen by everyone. Um, but to see what happened during the riots is something that most people only saw through, through the television. And, um, you know, this was the community I, I had grown up in. And, um, you know, the police department was not, not prepared uh, for what 
what happened. Um, most cars only had one shotgun and, and one helmet. And uh, I remember that uh, my partner, we were two young officers, we were from the same class, but because his paperwork got done quicker than mine, he had numbers. And in policing, numbers is huge because that means seniority. So he had seniority on me by like two numbers. And uh, I remember that he says, well, you know, due to my seniority, I'm gonna pick, I'm gonna pick the shotgun. And I was like, wow, thank God. I said, great, I'll take, I'll take the helmet. <laughs> and uh, I put that bad boy on. <laughs> and um, as I was walking on, on Willow Avenue, where, where I'd grown up, and a very diverse community, um, I saw things. Um, saw people throwing things at me. I saw people calling me a racist. Things that I was just not even, I, I didn't even understand, you know. Um, but what really caught my attention was right on Willow there was a pharmacy. And uh, I remember a station wagon, kind of like the Brady Bunch station wagon. And for some of us we remember that. For some of you younger folks, you don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but the Brady Bunch uh, <laughs> uh, station wagon uh, uh, stopped right in front of it. And uh, I saw in the front, uh, the driver's seat, there was, there was uh, a male. Um, there was a female in the uh, front passenger seat. And there was about three or four kids in the back. Uh, I made an assumption that um, that was mom and dad and the kids in the back. And um, I overheard the dad tell the kids in the back, and none of them were under, uh, over the age of 10, uh, in Spanish, to get in there. And what that meant was, is there was people looting in the pharmacy. Um, I, I, was, I was extremely shocked, and I have to be honest with you, I was angered. Um, as I approached the, uh, the vehicle, the kids noticed me, you know, because I was in uniform, and they slowed down and kind of had that look like looking back at their parents, like, what should I do? And I, 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 approached, I approached the dad, and I asked him what he was doing. You know, and we were talking in Spanish. And he said, everybody's doing it. <laughs> and, and, and it took me a little while to really take that in, to, to hear somebody who's a father to say, everybody's doing it, so therefore I'm going to let my kids do it. And I'm telling you, they're under 10. They're all, they're all, they're all out there getting ready. Um, I told him to, to leave or I was going to arrest him. He packed his kids up and he left. About 30 minutes later, I was at a different section, and, and, the, and the looting and, and the crime was, was pretty significant at that time. Um, so much so that you could almost not do anything. You were just hoping that nothing got burnt down or people weren't getting beaten is all we could do. The looting was just something that was going to happen regardless because there was not enough of us. But 30 minutes later, uh, I saw the Brady Bunch car again. And um, I sat at another location, and I saw the kids leaving with stuff. So um, that was pretty impactful for me. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm telling the story today because it's still something that has been ingrained in me. And I think that that's a, a significant uh, emotional event that occurred that has stayed with me throughout my life. Um, I continue to, to progress through through the uh, police department. I worked over s almost six years in homicide. And um, I, you know, I bring that up only because, uh, as I said, you know, I, I speak with my, those significant others of, of my family who, who see me on a daily basis. And um, you know, my wife told me, you know, working in homicide has changed you. And I think that's just a, something that happens physically because of the things that you see, that maybe you become a little bit colder uh, with things that happen, and um, maybe it's a mechanism. I, I'm not smart enough to know the reasons, but I can only tell you um, that maybe I haven't seen it, but I think my family has seen some of that. And so I'm cognizant of it, and I, I try to learn from it and make sure that uh, I, I move forward and understand it and hopefully correct that. You know, the birth of my daughters are, other, are, are, are huge. Um, I have a, my daughter, my oldest is 20, and she's at, uh, in San Diego in her third year, and uh, you know, being a dad and then, uh, is, is, is powerful. You know, it's the most important thing that I do. 
And um, my second daughter was born in 2001. And I think I told you earlier that I didn't learn about my, wa uh, my wife, my mom, about her sacrifices really until later on in life. And, and it was right before I had kids. And, and so every time I had a, my child, I thought back, you know, could I do what my mom did? And then my mom's been an important uh, role model in my life. And uh, if she was here today, I would tell her that, you know. Um, me and my mom are probably made of the same fabric. So if you see us together, you would think we didn't care for each other. But we're built the same, you know, in the sense of that we're, we're, uh, we're aggressive in the sense of we want to accomplish things and we move forward. And, and that's, that's how I was raised. 9-11 um, occurred, another significant emotional event, I think, not only for me, but, but for our country and the things that happened. And I was in policing and policing, policing made a change. Um, I was then in charge of, of counterterrorism for, for the city I worked for. And... Uh, over 500,000 people. I went, to, I went to England to study on how they recover so quickly. And so I think, um, I think th that incident that occurred in our country has changed us uh, as far as how policing and how we deal with safety issues. So, um, so I spent almost 20 years serving a community that I had gr grown up in. And um, I had gone through every position available to me for the exception of being the chief of police. And, and the community had decided to go in a different direction, and so I, I made a decision that I needed to leave uh, the city, and I went to another city, a little bit smaller city. And on uh, September 6, uh, 2010, uh, I was sworn in as the chief of police for that community. Um, that was uh, a, a <coughs> great day, in, in my view, but it was also a sad day, in, in the sense that um, um, you know, my grandfather had been the only real role model, a male role model I had had in my life. And b due, to, due to distance, um, I didn't really see my grandfather as I grew up. But as I told you, in 1981, I, I met my, my wife, my wife-to-be, I should say. And um, their family, my, my in-laws became, uh, I, I've been blessed with my in-laws. Um, my... Uh, father-in-law, John, um, has been a, a role model, a male role model in my life, seeing, seeing how he treated his family and, and hopefully has guided me in being a good parent because I, I saw a lot of great things in him. Um, I, I defined their, their family, and I know there's some people in here that know my wife's family, so they'll probably laugh when I say, you know, I, I always nicknamed them the Hispanic uh, Walton family, um, the Waltons. And... Uh, and uh, so on this day that I was sworn in, um, unfortunately, my, my father-in-law was very ill. And right after I was sworn in, uh, we left and we went back, we w we went back home to his house to, to see him. And, and he, he passed away that day. And uh, uh, we were, he was very, um, he had his faculties and we were talking. And one of the things uh, that we had discussed was, you know, when I became chief, he wanted to see six bars Six stars. And as many of you know, I, I, I wear four stars. But uh, there was a certain sheriff that wore five. And he said, I, I want you to wear six just because uh, <laughs> you, you need to be above him. And uh, so that day when I, when I went, uh, I, I remember he's, he's in his bed. And, and he looked at me. And we were talking. And he congratulated me. And he goes, but there's no six stars, you know. <laughs> I, I, hadn't the I hadn't had the time, the ability to go have somebody make them. And, and put him on just to, for him to see it. But uh, he, was, uh, he was an important role model in my life, a male role model uh, who I saw for, for many years and how he treated his family. And, and I'm hoping that some of that just small uh, characteristics that he had has, has been put upon me. Um, you know, 2015 is an extremely important uh, year for, uh, for UCI. Uh, you know, it's 50 years. Um, and uh, it, it's a time to reflect, you know, for, for, the, for the campus. But, uh, you know, uh, 2015 was also uh, an important year for me because uh, I also turned 50. And it was a time to, uh, to reflect, um, you know, as an as a individual that's been in public safety, you have the ability to retire at the age of 50. That's full service. Uh, and um, so I was reflecting... Um, to 
to see what the next you know chapter in my life was in 2015. At the same time, my uh, my my oldest daughter was graduating and would be attending college in in, in the fall of 2015. So there was a lot of things uh, going on um, that were extremely important. And um, you know, we I started doing a little bit of research for my for my daughter because, as many of you who have kids, you want to make sure they're in a safe environment. So I started doing research about universities, and, and that's where I learned about campus policing. You know, I learned that how they were engaged in communities, and if they weren't engaged with their community, she wasn't going there. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, we had battles. Dad, why can't I go there? She just can't go there. Because um, I won't pay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you pay, you go anywhere you want. Um, but, um, you know, at that same year, uh, while I was reflecting into what my next path was going to be, um, I was getting a lot of LinkedIn messages, I, just, just a ton of them. I, I wasn't part of it, but yeah, I joined, you know. So finally, I asked my sister, eh, just put it up, I don't really know. And so, um, I did, and I didn't know you could receive a message. And one day I received a message. And before, I'm going to show you the message. And that's how I'm going to conclude my, my, my talk here today. And hopefully you'll have questions uh, for me. Um, but I have to take you back to 1997. I was, I was a homicide detective. And again, I worked murders, uh, undetermined deaths, officer-involved shootings, and ransoms. And um, the police department had received a call. A and I want to preface this before I start and tell this story. I'm, I'm not here to politicize any issue. But the reason I'm telling this story is because I think it's important. And I think it's going to tell about where policing has been for many, many years in California. And I, I'm just a product of it. And I think I'm a product of that just because of the profession and because of the communities that I've served. And so in 1997, we received this call from, from this uh, Hispanic family, and they request us to, to, to their house. And when we arrive to their house, they tell us that um, they had come to the States undocumented a few years earlier. And they had saved up for a few years to, to get their daughter across. And uh, they, had, they had saved $3,000. They had taken them some time to hire a coyote to bring, an o bring over their daughter who was under the age of 10. And, and for parents, think about giving your daughter to somebody you don't even know, to bring them over, over a border, not knowing how they're getting here. But that's how desperate you are because this is a country of opportunity. And so um, we get there, and uh, what had happened was that after um, this young lady had been brought over, um, they were holding her. Uh, at the time, we did not know, but they were holding her in a small city in the county of Los Angeles, and they had called the parents, and they had said, things have changed. We need an additional $3,000 for you to see your daughter. They obviously didn't have the money, and so they called the police department uh, as their last resort because they did not obviously want to involve the police department. So we went out there. Um, I was on call, so I, I went out there. We talked. We had to uh, involve the Federal Bureau of Investigations, the FBI, and at that time, we had to triangulate, and we kept talking with these individuals. And it took us about 48 hours, but, uh, you know, the, uh, the story ends well. We, we found her, and we found many other individuals in this house that were being held for additional funds. Um, so I thought my job was done. Um, packed it up, you know, uh, go about my business. And about six months later, um, I received a call. And it was from the mother. And the mother uh, made a comment um, on my recall uh, that, you know, there were some problems with, with the daughter. She wasn't attending school. And she wanted, she had nowhere to turn. She wanted to see if I would come out and talk to the daughter. I'm not sure if she just wanted to see if she could scare her into going to school because I was a cop. <laughs> and that's what they do usually. Yeah, bring the cop in. Let's scare the kid, you know. Um, <laughs> So I, 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 I paused, I have to be honest with you. I paused and asked myself, is, is this my job? You know, and, and, and it took me a little while, but she was still on the line. And I made a decision. 
But I said, it doesn't hurt. It's part of, it's part of serving you know, communities. And so I, I told her that uh, what I would do is upon my day you know, ending that I would drive by and, and make contact with her daughter. And uh, so I, di I did. I, I drove by, I stopped. Um, I have to be honest, I, I told her that your, your mom had made a lot of sacrifices to get you here and this is, you had a great opportunity, don't blow it. I'm, I'm not sure if I got through to her, you know. Um, you know I think if I recall correctly, maybe the eyes rolled a little bit. <laughs> and um, I've seen that before somewhere. <laughs> um, and uh, I left. I was done. I went about my business. I left the city and in 2010. Uh, I was in another city as the chief. And I got this, uh, got this LinkedIn email. I think I can do it. I can't do it. I think I can do it. Don't know how to do it. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go this way. I have some skills. Ah, oh, no, I don't. <laughs> Next. I did hit that. Where is it? Which one? Enter. Ah, thank you so much. I appreciate <laughs> it. So, so people ask me, you know, 2015, you're reflecting, you know, what are you going to do? And I received this. I received this email a message through LinkedIn, and this is why I do it. You know, I've had some great jobs, um, but able to assist people has been my passion. And um, I tell everybody, and they probably tell you, yeah, we've heard it from the chief. You know, uh, I wake up with a smile on my face because I, I, I go to something that I love to do. And the day that I don't have that passion, it's, it's the day you gotta keep, you gotta move on. His life is too short, but um, when I received this, 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 this was and is still today the reason why I do policing. It's when somebody can call you back 18 years later to thank you for, for whatever I did, which was very minimal, because the reality is it was her parents that did a lot for her, not me. It was the community that she worked in, uh, excuse me, that she lived in that, that helped her too. So. Policing is about communities engaging together to solving issues. It's not about one individual. I, I, I just have the honor uh, to be the chief of police here, and I've been the chief at another community. Um, but it's, it's really the men and women that do the job. It's, it's the community that we serve and working together. I'm, I'm a true believer in community policing, and hopefully this attests to that, because here we are talking about a certain issue here in 2017, that in 1997 we were already doing. We were serving communities regardless of your documentation. 20 years ago. We don't, we don't need a policy driven to us. This is something that policing has been doing. And so we, we police communities for the betterment of them. And we enforce your laws. You know, so. Um, that's my short story, 52 years, uh, and try to get it in 30 minutes so we could ask questions. Um, you know, I, I, I wish my mom was here, but she's out of town. I would have brought her in here because uh, I think it's important for people to understand. Um, without her making that decision in, in 1971, I wouldn't be here. And I have to be honest with you, I, I, I struggle today to say, I'm not sure if I could have done it. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm, I'm that strong to be able to take that hard path. But she took the hard path. Um, so, you know, I have a lot of respect for my mom, and, and I love her. So, thank you. I guess this is where you guys can ask me questions. Yes. You got it? Give him the mic. Uh, I just wanted to start this out by saying I was actually a 
came in for you at the Salem Police Department when you first came in a couple years ago. So I've gotten an opportunity to see your tenure as chief of police from both the uh, administrative side and also the uh, community side. And I wanted to commend you on the work you do. I think that you're an excellent individual to represent our campus. Thank you. Um, with that said, at UC Irvine, there is a, a multitude of views. And it's a very big community. And a lot of people here are very passionate about what they believe and they stand up for it. Mm -hmm. um, as chief of police, how do you navigate between creating an open space for all these different views, um, also ensuring the safety of the people on the campus and your officers? Great question. That is a really great question. So first and foremost, I, I want people to understand that the police department does not work in a vacuum. So your question that you're asking is really, it is a, what I would define as a co community governance approach that UCI has, and that's why it works so well here at UCI is because we have that community governance approach to this issue. And so, but we play a, a significant um, portion in that. And, but I, I want to tip my hat off to Student Affairs because I think they do a very good job. So here at UCI, what we try to do is, when, and, and we're in, in an academic environment where I think we want to uh, give people the ability to voice their opinions in a respectful manner and so forth. And we're going to have opposing views. And I think that is what is great about this country is that we have the ability to have opposing views. And our job, and I think it's, a, it's the uh, campus's job to have safe environments for that. And so we have a constructive engagement team that we work with very close. And they come out first and they engage with the, if we have opposing views. And we, we try to find out what their ultimate goal is. And the, the, what we try to do is have a win-win solution. If they, if they have uh, a goal in mind, we want to make sure that they, they succeed and vice versa. And so one of the things that we do is we make sure that we work very uh, close with uh, student affairs. Our job is to make sure that there's a safe environment. We don't want to stifle anyone or any group uh, from expressing themselves. And so um, we navigate very, that fine line very well. I think it's worked out very well. Yes, we've, have we had issues? Yes, just like any other community where there is diversity. They, you know, there, that's, that's a spectrum of differences and similarities. And so when you have differences, you're going to have sometimes um, this engagement of tension. And our job is just to make sure that we keep that tension because we grow from tension, but it's in a safe manner. And I hope that I've answered your question. Do I get an A? Wow. Hi, I'm curious. You mentioned um, at cer certain points you learned that you really were drawn to policing. And yeah. so were there any particular instances or types of instances that helped you come to that realization? So it's um, a really good question. So, so when I was, uh, when, I, when I got the job at, uh, at the campus police at San Luis Obispo because I needed that, I needed that cash, um, you know, I had my own perceptions uh, of policing. And, and I have to be honest with you, they weren't, they weren't the best because of where I grew up. Um, but I, I, I sensed or, or I recall how they treated students and, and they treated them with the utmost respect. And then that really enticed me to give back to my community um, because I think um, while my mother was a big influence, I think I had you know, professors and, and other organizations that helped me through, and so I wanted to give back. And I, when I became a reserve officer, I went to different programs that the police department had, usually that dealt with community policing in the sense of prevention and intervention. And I noticed um, it ignited something in me um, in the sense of that I wanted to serve people. And uh, look, architecture is, is, is a great profession. I think I, I love it. Um, but I was working very large uh, uh, designs. I did part of the Orange County Performing Arts Center. And so when you start looking at big projects like that, you tend to spend a lot of time behind a desk. And I, I miss that interaction um, with people. And so um, I would say it was in me. I, I, from, from the from the get-go, uh, I think it just took me, I, I just took a different path to get there. 
uh, maybe a path that taught me that, oh, this ain't for you. You need to be with people. I don't know. Like I said, it, it was in me. I, I knew it was in me. It, it just took me a little while just because I, um, I wasn't sure how I was going to tell my mom. That, that's, that, and that's the truth. And she's only like 4'11". <laughs> you know. Um, good question, though. I have a question. Yes. Do you have a faith, and has it played any significant part in what matters to you in life? Hmm. That's a good, that's a really good question. I'm trying to answer this very honestly. Uh, I, I I do. I do have a faith. I I the reason I hesitate is because sometimes um, maybe I haven't really um, put a lot of time into that. You know, so uh, maybe that's something. But I do follow um, the things you see here. And, and I think I, I follow a path that I'm very comfortable. And um, I can look myself in the mirror. And, and I'm, I'm very comfortable. I, I just I, I follow the, a direction that, that I think has been from above. And so I have no issues with it. But uh, I could do a little bit more as far as maybe attending mass a little more. Um, but yes, uh, and I think it has some of that to do. And look, we, um, you know, today you're learning about me, so I'm, 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 an, I'm an open book, and I tell people that. Um, you know, my mom went through very hard times, and my mom was very religious, uh, and my mom lost faith, and, and, and she lost faith in, in a certain religion. And we, we, I remember that we would go different weeks, and we'd have a different pastor in our, uh, in our house. You know, and like, oh, this is a new one, okay. And, uh, and, and I think she was looking for something just because of the, the things that she went through. And so for a period of time, I think uh, we may have lost a little bit of that, but I think it, uh, in the end, we came back in the sense of that we, we have a strong faith in, in, in our family. Thanks so much for sharing your perspective today. Um, with regards to policing, are there certain strategies that might work out in uh, municipalities that you have decided to shy away from on campus that just don't fit into our community governance or our educational environment? So a good, great question. So yes, so I, I would say that um, we live in a, in a great community. Um, you know, there's crime everywhere, um, but we have very low crime uh, compared to other communities, compared to communities that I've led. And um, so there are certain strategies that w I would definitely use because I think it's important for those communities to feel safe that I don't think are needed here because we don't have that issue. And so to answer your question, yes, there are certain uh, processes that we don't use here at UCI because we just don't have a need for it. And so. Um, I've gone around uh, the campus. I'm a believer in prevention, intervention, and enforcement. We do wear a tool belt. There is a reason why we wear a tool belt, and that is our enforcement piece, um, because we are here to enforce your laws, policies, and procedures. But we do very, very minimal of that. M a majority of our job is prevention and intervention, and we now have added a, a education to that. I call it pi squared now instead of just pi. But um, so there are things, um, there are differences in approach between municipalities and campuses. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we all want the same thing, which is we want a safe environment for our community. And we just have to follow different paths to get there um, because we have to take into our account um, the characteristics of our communities. Um, thank you for your talk. I really yeah. appreciated it. So I was curious about your transition between different communities. For context, I'm a graduate student here. I grew up and did undergrad in Virginia and transferred to the state where I'm right now. Um, what strategies have you used when you're switching between communities to like get connected and understand what things are and how to approach it and so on? It's a very good question. So, so this is my third agency. And uh, so the first agency is very easy because I grew up in the community. Uh, the second I did not, but I, I've used the same process. I think when you're new to, to any organization or culture, um, you have to first learn the culture. And so you have to, you know, you have to listen, 
observe and watch. And so, and then start to talk with all of the key components that make that community. And so I think in, you know, in a campus, it's faculty, staff, students, and visitors. And, and so I've made it uh, one of my um, key points is to go out and meet individuals from all those spectrums and being able to listen to them and from that then start to guide uh, the police department in a direction. And so we've, we've done a few things. We've changed our vision, mission statements. Um, those are already on our website. We continue to, to evolve just like any other organization or profession. Um, there's always room for improvement. And those things occur not only through a silo. You know, we alone cannot make those changes. We look to our communities to, to assist us. And I'll give you an example. I'm a, I'm a believer that, um, you know, you attack issues from the front and not wait till things have happened. And so I'm a believer that communities have to be involved in how we hire people and how we train people, that they should have some input into that because then they have ownership of those individuals. And then when things go awry a little bit, we work together to solve those issues. And we don't point fingers because now you're, you're incorporated into that decision. So very good question. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm scared of your question. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> has to do with uh, community policing. Mm -hmm. um, similar to the question in the back, uh, I'm just wondering if there are, just a bit of background on it, are there advantages of community policing on a campus um, as opposed to in a, a large municipality? And just connected to that, uh, I'm, I'm mistaken, you're an alum of, of Thornton High, North Long Beach? That is correct. So I've, I've encountered students here on campus who are from Jordan High, and I tell them, did you know the chief of police is an alum from, I guess it's a Panther, and they're- Go Panthers. <laughs> they're shocked. And so, you know, if just in terms of building community policing, are there ways that communities, they wouldn't feel shocked, ways to, no. I don't know how to articulate that, to connect to that. Yeah, so one of the things that we're, we're out and doing is that interaction with our students. And so we've done, you know, when they first arrive, orientation, we're incorporated into that. When housing has programs, we incorporate ourselves into that. When University Hills has functions, we incorporate. I think we just need to be, and, and, and I throw this out all the time, we're a thread of the fabric. And, and we're, 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 th we're just one thread of this community fabric. And so, um, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a hard area. I mean, no, North Long Beach is, is, a, is a tough area, and there, there are perceptions that occur based on that. And so I think community policing is a word that is used throughout this state and throughout this country. And most police departments will tell you they're a community policing department. And I think um, every department will believe that that they, they're it, that they are the, the um, symbol of it. Um, but community policing is a philosophy, and it has to be a way of life. You can't, it's not a program. It's a way, you know, we, you have to look for long-term solutions instead of putting a Band-Aid. And, and let me just tell you why certain communities can't do what we can do here. It's because of the repetitive calls that they have. They have so many calls that they have to do the Band-Aid approach. Meaning, they've got to get to that call, find a solution for that period of time, resolve it, and go on. But community policing is about long-term solutions. And, and, and the goal in the philosophy is that at some point you will never need a police department, if you think about it, right? If, if the goal is to find long-term solutions, and you do find those long-term solutions, then you minimize policing. So that is the ultimate goal of community policing. And, and, and I think, you know, as, uh, as a race, we, we need to get there. Um, so I believe that being at a campus, um, we can't be a traditional policing. I, I think that's, that doesn't really work here. Um, we have to be a community policing department who believes in long-term solutions to do prevention and intervention and attack those issues not so by ourselves, but working in a community governance uh, system because many of the things that we deal with, and we change hats 
uh, on many issues that w that we deal with. We deal with, um, you know, alcoholism. Uh, we deal with um, uh, child abuse. We deal with domestic violence. We deal with uh, sexual assaults. These are things that we don't solely work together. You know, what the great thing about UCI is the resources that we have that can help us in finding long-term solutions. So um, that's why I'm here, is because of that community governance. That, that really, an individual has really believed in community policing. I, I think I it can be accomplished here with your assistance and with everybody else's assistance. I alone can't do it myself. Uh, the police department alone can't do it. It's a community uh, way of life that if we really believe in it, that we'll, we'll accomplish it. So I, I hope that's answered your question. No other questions? Oh, okay. Well, I want to thank you so much. I really appreciate it.